Hi, I'm Josh, and I'm so grateful that you have decided to join me as I do an actual proper book review. I make videos about every single book that I read, but most of the time it's just me talking about things that kind of struck me as I was reading the book, and I don't really do formal reviews. But after reading all 2,223 pages of the Lycanius trilogy, which consists of The Shadow of What Was Lost, An Echo of Things to Come, and The Light of All That Falls, I figured if anything does deserves a proper book review, it is this gigantic trilogy. It is a chunky, chunky trilogy, for sure. Now, I am going to do a very in-depth review, but I'm also going to keep it spoiler-free, so don't worry. I will not spoil any plot points. I'm just going to keep the actual plot section of it as vague as possible. So what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to start by giving a very brief synopsis of the world in the start of the first book. Then I'm going to give an overview of the type of books that these are. Then I'm going to examine the interesting themes this trilogy covers. Then I'm going to talk about some individual things I liked and didn't like. Then I'm going to argue that the books were poorly written from a technical point of view. And then I'm going to wrap up with some words of wisdom from the books before finishing up with my overall feelings and ratings of the trilogy. I have three pages of notes to cover, so let us not waste any time and let's get into it. So let's start off with just the briefest of synopses, just so that I don't end up spoiling any plot points. Essentially we have a fantasy world here where there's a kind of a caste system that is determined by an individual's ability to use magic. So about a generation before the events of these books takes place, the caste system was sorted such that at the very top tier were the augurs, and these were the people who had the most magic using ability. Then, And they were also the kind of rulers of the world. Then underneath the augurs were the gifted, and the gifted were people who had a limited amount of magic using ability and they sort of assisted the augurs with ruling over everybody else. And the bottom tier basically consisted of people who had no magic abilities whatsoever. Now this, like I said, was the situation about a generation before the book started, and what had happened in the meantime was a revolution had occurred where the non-magic users rose up and essentially flipped that system on its head so that the rulers essentially were the non-magic users, the gifted were kind of tolerated to a certain extent, they were essentially isolated to their own little schools, and then the augurs were eliminated altogether. Essentially if it was discovered that you were an augur, you were executed. It was a capital crime just to be an augur. So that's essentially the situation we find ourselves in when the book opens up. And we begin the first book, The Shadow of What Was Lost, in one of these schools for the gifted. We are following a few 16-year-olds within this school who are very quickly pulled out of this school on a bit of a quest because they find out that the boundary is weakening. So apparently in the much more d distant past, a couple thousand years ago, there was an evil ruler who had ro risen up and who had collected this army of Banes, who are these monsters, and had attempted to take over the world, but apparently they were pushed back and they were isolated to the far north of the kingdom and a gigantic boundary was put around their province to contain them so that they couldn't come out into the rest of the kingdom and continue to cause problems. So rumors have gone out that the boundary is weakening and perhaps some of these monsters are being able to slip through. So our 16 year old protagonists leave the school in search of what is happening with this boundary. That is just the beginning of just tons of massive events that are going to be happening throughout the three books, but I don't want to essentially get into any more than that because even the synopsis on the back of the first book spoils one kind of plot point, so I don't want to do that for you. So book one here is essentially kind of a journey or quest with these characters setting out to try to discover what's going on. Book two, An Echo of Things to Come, is more focused on larger political machinations. There's a lot of politics at play in conflicts that are happening on a national level. And then book three, The Light of All That Falls, eventually gets more into sort of large-scale warfare between nations. 
So what starts off as kind of a simple-ish sounding quest turns into this big world-changing series of events that happens throughout the trilogy. So that in a nutshell is what the books are about. So now we'll look a little more closely at what type of books these are. So obviously this is a huge epic high fantasy trilogy. Like I said, each individual book averages out to about 750 pages. So it is a giant fantasy epic that takes place in this world that has a deep history. It has this tiered magic system, like I said, and it has loads of characters and locations. In fact, the character glossary that is in book three has 88 characters named in the glossary, which for me is a lot to keep track of. You Wheel of Time readers with your 2,782 named characters in the Wheel of Time series might scoff at the 88 characters in the Lycanius trilogy, but for me that was a lot of people to keep track of. And speaking of that glossary, what really saved me with these books was the fact that A, each book had a glossary of characters as well as a glossary of other places and things, but at the beginning of books two and three there was a synopsis of the entire plot of the series up until the start of each book. So that really helped in terms of sorting out everything that was going on. I read the synopsis at the beginning of book two and was like, Oh, is that what that was all about in book one? Okay, and then same thing with book three. I was reading the summary of events of books one and two and going, oh, okay, I understand some things here that I did not understand previously. So, man, I think all fantasy series need this kind of summary in each book of events that lead up to that point because it really made things a lot easier from a reader's perspective. It was hard to keep track of all the names of characters and places and creatures and other things. And you know it's an epic fantasy trilogy because of the fantasy naming system that uses words split by apostrophes. I'll give you an example on screen here of several nouns that were part of this series that use this fantasy naming system. But what made things slightly more confusing was there was often two names for things. For instance, that boundary, there was a fantasy term for the boundary, which was used interchangeably with just the boundary. And it would have been a little bit easier if they just called it the boundary because every so often I'd run across that weird word and I'd go to the glossary and go, oh yeah, that's the boundary they're talking about there. And one of the characters here goes by at least three different names as well, which let's have one name for each thing in a book this size, in a series this size, so I can keep track of what's going on. Now the Lycanius trilogy is more plot driven than character focused. For the size of the books, there's not a lot of character development that happens with most of the characters. There is, to a certain extent, and there is one major exception. One character named Caden experiences a huge growth arc which is really one of the most interesting arcs of any character I've ever read. So it feels like all the character development was centered on this one character and the others felt slightly flat. For instance, our three 16 year olds that we start out off with are all very good people and they do good things and there's not a lot of depth or shades of gray to their characters. If they raise their temper at against one of their friends, then a paragraph or two later you'll see them apologizing because they're just these good, sweet people who are just trying to do good in the world. And we don't see much depth or development beyond that. And here's what's disappointing about that, because like I said, we start off with these characters as 16-year-olds, and the total events of the three books here take place over about a two-year period, roughly. And what's really weird is that these 16, 17 year old characters act very much like middle-aged adults. We see them taking on major leadership roles within the nations and we see them doing things that are on a huge scale and in every way they act like adults and yet you tend to forget that these are kids who are starting off in a school. So as a result of the general lack of character depth, I found it didn't grow very attached to any of the characters. And they just felt like average middle-aged adults, even though they were young teenagers still. 
Now the way this series is written is through a lot of jumping around in timelines. We have a certain amount of memory loss and memory recovery. So there's a lot of flashbacks, a lot of recovered memories of the past that are happening. And I'll also say that there is time travel involved with the books. It's an important element of the series. And so between the flashbacks, the recovered memories, the time travel, it puts a lot of burden on the reader to keep track of the timeline and the proper sequence of events. It can get very confusing as we're bouncing around between timelines. And I discovered I really just dislike time travel in books partly as a result of having to keep track of what is going on and when it's happening. My life would certainly be easier if it was more of a linear progression of events, especially in a series of this size with so much stuff that's happening. So in book one, we see these characters sort of embarking on their adventure. The climax of book one, without spoiling anything, I gotta say that it had me rolling my eyes pretty hard. So I can't really talk about it without spoiling stuff, so I'll just leave it at that. Book two had some more, much more welcome, lighthearted, and humorous moments, whereas book one and book three were very serious in tone, and I sort of missed the lighthearted moments that we have sprinkled throughout book two to a certain extent. But that, in general, is the overview of these books and the way they're structured. Now, regarding adult content in these books, these have very typical North American Christianity-based morals in that there is no sex, no drinking, no swearing, but loads of graphic, gory violence, which really kind of has always puzzled me the way uh, we are conditioned in North America to feel that anything related to do with loving each other physically or using certain curse words are terrible things and yet we have all the room in the world for in incredible graphic violence which is rather strange to me. There is one scene where it's very faintly implied that two characters have sex but beyond that the kind of curse word they use is fates and that's just the one made up curse word that everybody uses throughout the entirety of all these books here. But the violence, it starts very early in book one. It is very graphic. There are body parts going everywhere throughout all three books, which doesn't bother me particularly. As somebody who worked as a paramedic for 16 years, I kind of have a strong stomach for anything related to biology and physiology getting messed up. That was just kind of part of the work I did. So that thing, sort of thing doesn't affect me too much. As long as it's not sexual violence, that's something I can't stomach. Fortunately, we don't see that in the Lycanius trilogy. What is really strange about the violence in these books, though, are how unaffected the characters are by just all of this incredible violence and death that they experience at the age of 16 and 17. These events that would cause horrible PTSD to any normal person seem to just happen and then the plot just keeps chugging forward because it's a plot driven book and it's not really a character focused story with that one major exception I talked about. Now in the third book there are a couple of instances of characters kind of recognizing that they have experienced some pretty horrible things but they just kind of say oh we don't have time to think about that and it gets kind of brushed off. So here's a couple of quick examples. So one of our characters, one of the 16 year olds, is a guy named Davian and it says Davian watched silently as the victor was ushered away and the loser's corpse dragged unceremoniously from the arena. This violence was awful, barbaric, but he had seen far worse over the past few years. Such things didn't shock him as they once would have. That worried him sometimes. <laughs> and that's kind of the end of Davian's self-assessment there. Later on, we see another character thinking about the same thing. This is another of the teenagers, a young woman named Asha, and it says, Another twinge of sadness threatened Asha's focus, but she shook her head to herself, not letting it take root. That was getting easier and easier, in a way. There was so much for which she wanted to grieve. One more thing barely seemed to make a difference at the moment. So again, she's a 16, 17-year-old who has experienced the death of people that she loved, and she's just like, oh, we don't really have time to grieve or really think about it. So that's about the extent of the effect that the violence has on our young characters here. Next up, let's look at some of the themes that are covered in the trilogy. And 
The books do cover several interesting themes. I'm going to just mention them fairly quickly. I'm not going to dive into any of them in any great depth here, other than the last one, just for the sake of time here, not having this review become too overly long. So one theme that it covers is choosing between the better of two evils, where can we justify supporting one evil if it's maybe not as bad as another thing? And can we even justify genocide for the greater good of humanity? So can even the most horrible things be justified if we can see the bigger picture and somehow it's the better choice. So that's one thing. Tied to that is the theme of redemption. Can even the most evil person turn themselves around and be redeemed? That in itself could spark a huge discussion. But again, I'm just going to leave it at that and move on to the next one, which is memory and how memory defines our past and affects our future. Some of the characters we meet in the books, we're really not sure if they can be trusted, whether their motivations are good or not. And there's one character who is suffering from a lot of memory loss who isn't even sure if he can trust himself. He doesn't really know what kind of person he was in the past and whether he can trust himself going forward. So those are interesting themes related to memory. Next up we have checks and balances on power. How do we ensure that those who have power wield it responsibly? There's a constant struggle throughout these books of people who are in power, who are trying to do things, who are facing opposition from people who want to limit their power. Sometimes that's a good thing, sometimes it hinders good progress being made, so it's an interesting thing to examine. We also have the trope of found family, who are our true loved ones in life, especially when we don't necessarily have a traditional family, who are those friends in our lives who we can lean on and consider to be our family. And then the final theme, which I'll dive into by reading some passages from the books here, is one of religion and faith. and. What's slightly disappointing to me is the fact that the religion in the Lycanus trilogy is pretty much a carbon copy of Christianity. So we're examining some uniquely Christian themes here, which you'll see in a second, including one of the biggest themes in the book, which is the idea of free will versus fate. Does God or the gods determine everything that happens in our lives to the point where we don't have real free will? Or do the gods give us freedom to choose for ourselves what happens and not necessarily have a predestined path for us. So if you're familiar at all with Christian theology, this is sort of the old Calvinism versus Arminianism debate. But another interesting question that's asked throughout the book is, is it possible for a god or gods to be flawed? If a god is just somebody who has unimaginably more power than us, does that mean they are perfect beings? Or do they perhaps have the same flaws that we have, even though we don't have the same power as they do? Now let me read a couple of things just to illustrate what I'm talking about with the whole idea of religion in this trilogy. And if you're familiar with Christianity, you'll definitely see the parallels here, I think. So the god in the book is named El, E-L, and the devil character is named Shamaloth. So here's one of the longer passages I'm going to read to you just to illustrate this. A character named Nihim says, My belief is in El, the one god. The other character that Nihim's talking to replies and says, The god of the augurs, the god of predestination. That's right, Nihim sounded surprised at Caden's knowledge. El sees everything, is in perfect and absolute control. The grand design, it's called. Everything that happens runs according to his purpose. Caden replies, remind me to thank him for my last couple of months. Nihim chuckled again. I didn't say he was responsible. I said it runs according to his purpose. Shamiloth, the devil character, has his influences over this world too. He fights, but it's simply that he is in a war he cannot win, because every move he makes has already been accounted for by El. There was silence for a few seconds. Then why does El not simply finish him and be done with it? Stop every move he makes. Caden sounded irritated. Terrible things happen all the time. It hardly feels like he's losing. 
The point is, he's not losing. He's already lost. What you see are his death throes. Shemaloth was bound to this world in the Genesis War, and thus bound by time. He was trapped here, and now all he fights for is souls to serve him in his prison. He must not be doing a very good job. I haven't heard of many followers of Shambaloth, observed Caden, his tone dubious. It doesn't work like that. At the end of time, Al will leave this world, taking those who gave him their faith. When he does, what protection this world has will vanish, and it will fall to Shamaloth to rule what remains, and only what remains, for eternity. Any who do not leave with El will be left here and serve him, like it or not. There was a pause, Caden obviously digesting this. I can't say I like the idea of not being in control of my own destiny, he said eventually. If everything is already laid out, if there really is a grand design, wouldn't that mean we have no free will? Nehim grunted. I can't tell you how many times I heard that same question debated back in the Augur's day, he admitted. There are a lot of differing opinions, but I certainly think we have free will. Just because Al knows each choice I'm going to make, even if he created me knowing it's the choice I would make, doesn't mean it's not mine. He sighed. But perhaps it's still not free will as you would think of it. That's the natural arrogance of man, sadly. We want to believe that free will means complete independence from the plans of our Creator. There was a contemplative silence. Tell me one thing, though, said Caden after a while. Since the augers fell, how can you still have faith? Because my faith is in El. It was never in the augers or what they were once capable of, explained Nihim. You can put your trust in something that's obvious, that's measurable or predictable, but that's not faith. Nor is believing in something that gives you no pause for doubt, no reason or desire to question. Faith is something more than that. By definition, it cannot have proof as its foundation. So you can see here this debate happening between the ideas of predestination, the grand design versus free will and having choice in life. These themes are continued in book three in a couple of other passages here. We're back to Davian, who's thinking to himself, did he believe that Al cared? Even here at the end, he wasn't sure. He was certain that Shamaloth was evil, certain that this was the right thing to do. That didn't worry him. But the rest of it, Raeleth would have told him that there was no decision without doubt. He would say that all of this, all of the suffering and death and madness, was just a consequence of the world's separation from El, a consequence in a way of choice which is very much a Christian idea, the idea that the bad things that happen in the world are a result of humanity being given free will and the ability to choose good versus evil. Which brings up a common question here next. We're back with Davian again. Davian rubbed his forehead. That was what the old religion still taught, Davian says, and he doesn't just reveal himself, clear up the confusion because Raeleth shrugged. Because we're meant to realize that this is important and figure it out for ourselves. No decision without doubt, he added, clearly quoting something. Al could convince the world in a heartbeat, but if he did, it would no longer be our choice to follow him. Instead, he enables us to choose him. Again, getting into some problems with Christian theology. And then the final one is some thoughts about a world without God, or El. We have a character named Raeleth who's talking to Davian now, and Raeleth leans forward and says, Simply put, do you believe that mankind should have no authority higher than itself? Surely, surely that's not what the venerate are suggesting, Davian said. It is, and they would tell you the same. It is exactly what their version of El is offering. A world where all possibilities are promised is, by necessity, a world in which God cannot take part, cannot choose to affect the world in any way. If he exerts his will, even a fraction, he is by definition changing how things could have been. He is removing possible outcomes. Raeleth held Davian's gaze, calm certainty in his eyes. They are trying to convince everyone that our Creator wished to create a world in which he could not take part, could not help, guide, or save, in which he was functionally irrelevant. So let's take a break from the deep theological issues for a second, and I just wanted to let you know that this video is brought to you by my Patreon supporters. In the midst of all the awful things I've been going through these past couple of years. It's the fact that I have Patreon supporters out there who are putting their money out to support me, to help me do what I do. It's the knowledge that these people have my back that is helping me to keep going, keep making videos in the midst of a lot of other awful things that are happening. And I really can't express my thank you enough, especially to my higher tier Patreon supporters, Joanna, Paul, and Mojo. 
I'm actually getting slightly teary-eyed thinking that there are people out there who are willing to support me in that way. So thank you so much. And let's get back to the Lycanius trilogy with individual things that stood out to me as things that I either liked or disliked. So speaking of the hard things I've been through in the past couple of years, there's definitely some things that struck out to me. The most awful thing I have experienced is the loss of my wife and a couple of my closest friends, which I don't want to keep bringing up, but <laughs> the book had me thinking about that. Um, in particular, one character who lost his wife really brought up some kind of emotions as I was reading about that. So for instance, the character is looking at the body of his wife and it says, he stood over her looking down vacantly. Inside he felt nothing an emptiness so profound that it made it difficult to breathe. It was all so meaningless. She was gone, gone in a moment, and suddenly nothing that was to come mattered anymore. <sighs> that is a little, uh, I can't even express how that makes me feel. Part of that whole process is involves a lot of self-blame. There's certainly some self-loathing as part of the process and wishing that there could have been redemption somehow. And that leads into the next little part here. When a character is speaking here and says, there's a purity of purpose to redemption, I suppose, he eventually said softly, to being able to undo the things for which we hate ourselves, especially when we are told that it is in the service of the greater good. Asar grunted, nodding, the lesser of two evils, or the greater good. Get a good man to utter either of those phrases, and there is no one more eager to begin perpetrating evil. So that leads into the theme I mentioned earlier about the greater of two, or the lesser of two evils, or the greater good, and how that very concept can lead people to do bad things. Now here's one thing I thought was really cool, and obviously as an avid reader, it was a giant library. What was very cool about this library is in the center of it was a sort of magical device called the advisor where you just had to think about a subject and then all these lines of light would point out from the advisor to specific books on bookshelves around the library related to the topic that you were thinking about. This time a character named Malshash is hanging out with Davian in the library. Malshash grinned. Fortunately, the Derisians were a rather clever people. He guided Davian over to a short, squat pillar in the center of the room, atop which was a translucent blue stone. Place your hand over this and think of what you need to know. Davian touched the stone lightly. But I don't know what book I need. You don't need to know the name of the book. Just think of what you're trying to find out. A little skeptical, Davian took a deep breath and concentrated. He was there to learn... Uh, redacted for spoilers. That was what he needed. The stone beneath his palm began to glow. Davian snatched his hand away as if burned, though there had been no physical sensation. A thread of blue light crept from the stone, slowly but surely stretching out, moving toward the wall until it came to rest, touching the spine of a small red book. Another tendril appeared, this time drifting in nearly the opposite direction, eventually attaching itself to a book on the other side of the room. Three more tendrils appeared, Davian watching in stunned silence. When it became clear that there were to be no more more, he walked over to the first book, which itself now glowed with the gentle blue light. What a cool place. I want to go hang out there. And then one thing that just kind of made me chuckle here was this subtle plan that a character came up with. So they started off with a slightly more elaborate plan, and one character says, What if this doesn't work? asked Meldier. Isiliar gave him a dry look. Then we're back to the way we usually do things. Right. Punch everyone that's not us until they stop moving. <laughs> so, it was a clever plan. Now, in terms of some, some things that weren't quite fitting with my own experiences, <laughs> I've mentioned this in other fantasy books I've read, where authors love to describe dead people as having these expressions frozen on their dead faces, expressions of fear or terror or whatever. And like I've said before, as a paramedic, I've dealt with dozens of dead people, and that's not how dead people work. When you die, your muscles completely relax, and you don't have expressions frozen onto your faces. In this case, it says the character's expression, usually full of warmth and mirth, was frozen in a contortion of pure, wide-eyed fear. Yeah, it wouldn't happen if you were dead. 
here's another problem with dead people that again is just a bit of a thing that wouldn't happen a battle had just happened and there was a lot of dead people lying around less than an hour later it says he wrinkled his nose as he leaned against the southern wall. The midday sun was already going to work on the corpses, the smell permeating through the sharp tang of alcohol. No, bodies don't start decomposing less than an hour after they die. Or not to the extent that you would notice anything smell-wise. And again, like I've said with past fantasy books, because of my interest in arms and armor and reading history, following YouTubers who talk about using medieval weapons and that sort of thing. I'm sort of attuned to things that don't kind of make sense when they're talked about in a medieval battle sense. So we have this character who is wielding a crossbow. The woman shoots one guy and then it says, the woman who had shot him swept forward barely without pause, reloading the crossbow almost absently. And <laughs> the authors never obviously try to load a crossbow. It's not something you can do almost absently while you're on the move, literally in the middle of a fight, running from one player, one player, thinking about board games, for, <laughs> running from one person to the next. You're not going to be able to reload that crossbow or however you're, you're going to do it while you're on the move. Another thing that always kind of irritates me when I'm reading fiction is how much characters can read emotions in other people's eyes. <laughs> As if, just by looking at their eyes, they can tell exactly how a person's feeling. I marked a few examples, but I'll just read one of them here. And yet again, it's somebody speaking to Davian. No mark, not my place, said the blue-cloaked man. Davian thought he saw something approaching shame in his eyes. They always seem to know exactly what it is that the person's feeling just by looking in their eyes, which doesn't make much sense to me. The final thing which I felt was cheating to a certain extent is... There's a certain aspect of the magic abilities where a person can put their fingers on another person's forehead and essentially download their memories. And by doing so, they can learn skills that that person has learned pretty much instantly. So if you have a skilled sword fighter, the magic user could download the memories of the skilled sword fighter. And wouldn't you know it, all of a sudden they're a skilled sword fighter too because they have all this knowledge about sword fighting. I won't read the specific passage for fear of spoiling stuff, but it just felt, feels like kind of a, a cheap cop-out approach to <laughs> learning certain skills. But anyways, these were just a few things that kind of stuck out to me as I was reading. The next thing I'm going to look at is the fact that the writing in these books is downright bad from a technical perspective. Let me get into this a bit. And I hate to be critical, and this is why I don't usually do proper reviews, because I don't like criticizing the artistic works of other people, especially when I'm not a published author myself. And I want to be clear that I'm talking strictly from a technical point of view. From the point of view of storytelling, this is an absolute masterpiece in terms of the world that's created, the story that's told, how it's all woven together. I could never in a million years write a series of this caliber in terms of the storytelling aspect of things. It's, it's the technical things that really bugged me. Less than a hundred pages into book one, I was already tabbing passages that made me cringe so hard I was spraining my teeth. And I was really hoping it was just going to be a problem with book one because the author had self-published the first book initially. Wikipedia says that James Islington, the author, received multiple rejections and decided to self-publish the novel. But then within a year of self-publishing, Islington signed a deal with Orbit Books to publish a physical copy. And I was really hoping that books two and three, having been signed by a publisher, I assumed that editors would go through them and would fix up all the problems I was running into in book one, but for whatever reason that wasn't the case. Even with a publisher and presumably some editors, the books were chock full of things that made me just shake my head. And I'm going to give several examples just so you know I'm not trashing the book for no good reason here. And I'm not, tr and, and again, I'm not trying to trash the book, I'm just trying to make a point about the writing style. So I've done a little bit of studying on how to write. A great book on the topic is Stephen King's book called On Writing. That really was an informative and interesting book. And then, of course, 
I've looked up articles online, especially ones where authors give their how to write tips. And one of the things you most commonly see when it comes to writing dialogue is just write he said or she said or they said. Don't expand on that any further. Don't add adverbs except in the most rare situations. Just keep it simply he said, she said, they said. Because if you don't, you very quickly get to the point where you're over explaining things as an author and you're kind of assuming that your reading audience is not very smart to pick up on things themselves. And you'll see what I mean here when I give some examples. So these first few come from early in book one here. This is Davian talking. He says, I know, but the boundary is a long way north. We were always going to have to go further. And if the Signari are in Desriel, that's where I need to go. He hadn't come this far to turn back. If you don't want to come though, I will understand. That whole sentence, he hadn't come this far to turn back. I don't know why that's been inserted in here. That's obviously what's being portrayed by what the character is saying. Here's another example. Death breaks the bond, an impatient sounding Brishada said by way of explanation, seeing Davian's expression. She looked at them warily. Do not attack me, and do not use your powers, else there will be an army of administrators here within minutes. My saving you will have been for naught. Weir inclined his head. I wasn't going to, he said cautiously, and thank you. So, that very first bit here, an impatient sounding Brishada said, could have been just, Brashada said, full stop, we don't need by way of explanation. Obviously it's by way of explanation. She's explaining things. And she's sees Davian's expression, sure, that isn't necessary. And then here's an instance where the reply is, he said cautiously, we don't need the adverb in there, just say, I wasn't going to, he said. And the next example here, it's a bit of a longer one, so you can get a better picture of what I'm trying to talk about here. Davian squinted, trying to better see the wagon. It was solidly built, more so than normal. Instead of the traditional canvas roof, it had one of sturdy wood, making it look like a large box on wheels. <laughs> so, right off the bat, we're talking about a wagon. The more so than normal is an awkward statement in there. The only window visible was a small slit at the front. Chris crossed with thick steel bars that glinted in the firelight. After a moment, Davian realized that a heavy wooden beam lay across the f door, clearly to prevent anyone on the inside from getting out. If it's clear, we don't need to over explain that. Obviously, if there's a wooden beam laying across the door, it's to prevent people from getting in or out. Uh, that's over explained. You're right, he said, biting his lip. Quick pause there. If you want to be well hydrated, Take a drink of water every time a character in this series bites their lip. My goodness, all the characters do it all the time. Also take a drink of water every time a male character is described as having a scarred face. You'll be very well hydrated. You're right, he said, biting his lip. Whoever we're looking for must be locked in there. Wonderful, Weir sighed, but didn't dispute Davian's statement, evidently having come to the same conclusion himself. Obviously, if, if it's evident, you don't have to over explain it. We've come this far. I suppose we're going to try and get them out? Davian stared at the armed soldiers for a few seconds. I suppose we are, he said reluctantly. Again, just he said. We don't need reluctantly in there. The worst adverb that keeps coming up in these books is in the next section here. Asha bit her lip. Another character biting her lip, of course. And maybe after a while he might let slip why it's so important to him too. Exactly which you can then relay back to us, the Shadrahim smiled. Once we know the details, we can hopefully use the information to force the North Warden's hand, get him to have administration back off. And we would find a way to do it without implicating you, of course, he quickly assured her. He said would be fine there, we don't need he quickly assured her. Asha frowned, but that's all you would use the information for? That's all, promised the Shadrahim. Again, we don't need promised. We know that they're making a promise. It could just be said of the Shadrahim. Asha shook her head. It's a huge risk, she observed. Observed. Obviously, she's observing. Just say she said. And even if the North Warden doesn't tell administration about me, it doesn't mean he won't try to torture information from me himself. The Shadrahim nodded. I know, and I won't force you to be a part of this, he said seriously. That's the one that always gets me. So many times it's stated that the character said seriously, as if they're not being serious. This whole book, their characters are being serious. You don't have to say that he said seriously. That one 
really irritates me in particular. And just a couple more really quick examples. He shook his head slowly. Not that I can think of. It happened fast though. He prevaricated. He prevaricated? Prevaricated? Just, he said. Ugh. Oh, here's a couple just to finish up from the last book here. You need to rest, added Niha to Tal, this time without any hint of playfulness in her voice. She studied Davian assessingly. Uh, studied Davian assessingly. How else are you going to study somebody without assessing them? It's repetitious, unnecessary, over-explained. Okay, one last one here, then I'll drop the subject. I can't sustain even this for much longer, said Tal bluntly, the words a grim warning to hurry. <laughs> Get rid of everything after, said Tal. We don't need to know he said it bluntly. And we obviously know that the words are a grim warning to hurry. That's why he said those exact words. <laughs> we don't need that explained to us. Skipping forward a few paragraphs. What about Rayleth? asked Niha apprehensively. Get rid of apprehensively. Davian shook his head. I don't know, he said simply, addressing the statement to Raileth. Again, get rid of the simply. He said, she said. That's all you need. There you go. From a technical point of view, I kept being pulled out of the story by these little things that irritated me. Now getting away from the technical side of things to the story itself, here's another thing that was really bothersome, and that was the fact that in book three there's a kind of a side story arc going on between two characters named Aelric and Desia who sort of go off on their own little quest to do stuff. Again, don't want to spoil anything. And then they're just gone from the story. And way down the line, towards the end of book three, all of a sudden they pop back up. They've finished doing what they're doing. A lot of stuff has happened. It has been implied. But it's a whole side thing that just disappeared from the story. And the author actually addresses it after the story's finished and the acknowledgements are written. There's a couple of pages here titled Author's Note, Aelric and Desia, wherein the author goes to explain that, yeah, I know I just dropped that whole thread, that whole storyline, and the reason is if I had taken the time to explain everything that happened, the books were already long and I would have had to turn it into a four book series instead of a trilogy and plus this was all happening towards the end as the climax was happening and it might have taken characters away from the climax and all that stuff makes sense to me. I understand that the author didn't want to turn this into a four book series that yeah maybe this kind of side quest thing might have been frustrating for readers in terms of just as the climax was happening, taking them away from those events. And yet, I think it could have been made to work, and I would have really liked to hear that story, to understand what happened, and to make sense of exactly what was going on after those unwritten events occurred. You would have had to really hear a lot more about it. And the reason it could have worked is because the author ended up, throughout the course of the three books, kind of circling back to the point where in book three, we end up experiencing some very similar events in the exact same place that happened in book one. And when we were in book three, I'm sitting there going, we've already read this all before. This has all kind of happened before. And here we are, it's, we've circled back around and it's happening again. It reminded me of when I worked as a paramedic up in Northern Ontario. I was stationed out of a tiny little town of 1,700 people on the Trans-Canada Highway, and they had a Christmas parade. And so I volunteered to drive the ambulance in their little Christmas parade in this tiny little town. And we drove through this wee town of 1,700 people, this tiny little parade route. We got to the end of the parade route, and then I noticed we we're still going. And wouldn't you know it, we did a second lap around the parade route. I'm like, all right, I guess that's how one way to get around having a small parade is just do two laps of it. And that that felt like what was kind of happening in this book to a certain extent where we were circling back to events that were almost identical to earlier events that would happen, but they're just a little bit different in the way they played out. And I'm like, you could have just 
tightened up that story, gotten rid of the repetition, and you would have had time to tell the story of Aelric and Desia and what all they had gotten up to and why this stuff came out of the blue near the end of book three that made you go, what on earth did these two get up to, to for the, all this to have happened? So that was, from my point of view, a really poor choice from the writing side of things too. But let's leave all that behind and let's get to some words of wisdom that came up throughout these books. So these are just kind of some snippets that came up that I tagged as being kind of interesting and I'll just go through in chronological order as they came up in the books. And again, I won't dwell on them for too long. I'll more just kind of state them and move on for the sake of time here. So another of the teenage characters, the third one that hasn't been mentioned yet, is a fellow named Weir. And Weir watched her go, thoughtful now rather than angry. His mother didn't intimidate him anymore. She was just like the rest of them, willfully ignorant, passionately believing in something because she surrounded herself with people who also passionately believed in the same thing. He knew the type now, those who found it easier to listen to people who reinforced what they already thought rather than actually considering the opinions of those who didn't. Sounds like any discussion I've had on religion or politics. Let's not go back there again. <laughs> Interestingly, the rest of these little words of wisdom are coming up in book three here, so let's move on to that. The character Caden is speaking and says, I do not want to, and I know that this is a hard truth to bear, one of the hardest, but I didn't wish to keep it from you either. Truth can be a burden, but secrets are poison. Isn't that the truth? Interestingly enough, the next little quote here talks about burdens. And we're back to Asha talking to another character named Ellie. Asha shook her head. No, yes, I don't know, she admitted heavily. Of course I want to leave, but asking someone else to be in here for the shifts is, I'm not certain that I can do it. Ellie was silent for a moment. Sometimes not wanting to share the burden is a form of selfishness too, she said quietly. <laughs> which for people who have struggled a lot and dealt with a lot of pain and trauma, not wanting to be a burden is sort of what got me into my trouble, into trouble in my marriage. And yet not wanting to share the burden can be a form of selfishness too, which I found out too late. We have a character named Rayleth talking to Davian and Rayleth says, given what he has done, even if he has changed, I fear what he will ask of you. Evil men rarely convince others to their side by asking them to perform dark deeds for no good reason. They will always start with the lightest shade of gray. They so often use what seems like a good cause. That's going back to the theme of the better of two evils idea. Speaking of which, this next one relates to that a little bit. This time it's Weir talking and he says, I still think we should try to uphold the law, but I also understand now that what's right isn't always what's legal and that the opposite can be true too. Law is about order, not right and wrong, Terrace agreed, and the latter should always trump the former. And I certainly think it's true that we should think about what's right as opposed to what's legal in certain situations. And speaking of for what's right, we look at that in the very last one here. Davian said, it's not enough to fight for the right side. You have to figure out how to fight the right way too. If winning is truly all that matters, then we've lost sight of what's actually right and wrong in the first place. It's a very interesting point that the ends don't always justify the means, I guess. So those were little nuggets that I found interesting throughout the books. And let's wrap it up now, finally, by talking about my overall feelings and giving the books a rating. So book one, I felt was kind of the most fun for me because it felt like we were setting out on a bit of a quest or an adventure. There was a mystery going on with what was the deal with this boundary? Was it weakening? What was going on there? Book two started to get heavier and deeper as we explore larger things within the world, but it did have those nice moments of levity and humor that I appreciated. But book three is where that repetition I was talking about came in, where it felt like characters were just doing what they had always been doing. By about midway through the third book, I felt like here I am almost 2,000 pages into the trilogy and I don't know what we've actually accomplished so far. We certainly learned some information, but we're still sort of pursuing the same things that we were from the beginning of book one pretty much. And honestly, it just kind of dragged and <laughs> the feeling I had when I finished up book three was just kind of relief that it was finally done. 
Which is obviously not what you're aiming for with a book. You want to be sad that you're no longer in this world, that your time with these characters is over. But like I said, I never felt super connected to the characters. And I was just kind of glad that it was over. So overall, on a scale of 1 to 10, I'd probably rate the Lacanius trilogy a 6 out of 10 for my personal tastes. But if you're somebody who loves a big high fantasy story with a deep world and lots of action and you're not intimidated by dozens and dozens of characters and places and big intertwining events, I think you would love the Lycanius trilogy. If that's the type of thing you enjoy reading, I don't want any of my negative points to dissuade you from checking out the books. Because like I said, I feel like James Islington has done a masterful job from a storytelling perspective of weaving together this tale. Even though some things could have been done better, this is a first time author and what he succeeded in doing is really quite remarkable. If you've read this trilogy or any of the books in it, I would love to hear what you have to say about it. And if not, I just want to know what you're reading right now because that is something that always interests me. If you're still with me at the end of this long review, I really appreciate you taking the time with me today. Thank you so much. Holy cow, you made it to the end of this video. That really does mean a lot to me. The other thing that means a lot to me is if you would give it a thumb up or subscribe to my channel, or maybe share this video with one person that you think would enjoy it. Cheers. So at the top of the cast system, now I'm talking, the cast system consisted of at the very top of the cast system, where the essentially a, and now we'll look a little bit more closely about what these t <sighs> oh, for f sake. So the he's looking at this the character get a good man to utter either either get a good man to utter get a good man to utter either of these oh my god get a good man to utter either of those phrases and there is no one more eager to begin perpetu a, a a it's another thing that always sorts of irritate another thing with within in so many times it's like the, because if i had really what was this so, here's the thing, and this goes 